Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arua, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants. The premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 328 of our pharmacotherapy series which majors in diabetes mellitus. The first question reads, DGO is a 42-year-old, slightly overweight man. His height is, 5 feet 11 inches. He weighs 200 pounds. His BMI is 27.9 kilograms per meter squared. He has had a history of, type 1 diabetes mellitus for 17 years. DGO's medical care was sporadic until one year ago when he referred himself to a diabetes clinic because he was beginning to experience pain and numbness in his feet. At that time, he was fully controlled on a single daily dose of a pre-mixed neutral protamine Hagedorn and regular insulin mixture, Humulin 70 30ths, 45 units. He had not been testing his blood glucose concentrations, and his A1c was 13%. On physical examination, DGO was found to have an elevated BP, that is 160 systolic 94 diastolic, background retinopathy, and decreased pedal pulses bilaterally. He had decreased sensation to vibration and monofilament testing in both feet. DGO also complained of impotence and shooting pains in both legs. A spot collection for microalbuminuria was 450 mg of albumin per gram creatinine. The normal value is less than 30 mg per gram creatinine. DGO was transitioned to a basal bolus insulin regimen. His physician gave him a premel blood glucose target of 80 to 130 mg per deciliter. For the past several months, he has been treated with the following regimen. 14 to 18 units of insulin glulazine before breakfast, 14 to 18 units of insulin glulazine before lunch, 16 to 18 units of insulin glulazine before dinner, and 40 units of insulin glagine at bedtime. If his blood glucose level is high after lunch, he takes additional glulazine, approximately two hours after eating. If his blood glucose is high at bedtime, e.g., above 150 mg per deciliter, he takes additional insulin glulazine, 7 to 10 units, because his physician told him his blood glucose level needed to be lowered significantly. Blood glucose concentrations have been as follows. At 7 a.m. glucose concentration was 60 to 320 mg per deciliter. At noon glucose concentration was 140 to 280 mg per deciliter. At 5 p.m. glucose concentration was 40 to 300 mg per deciliter. The next question reads, in the past year, DGO's A1C has decreased to 7.1%. Currently, he has approximately five hypoglycemic episodes per week, primarily in the late afternoon and early morning hours. These are characterized by intense hunger, sweating, palpitations, and, according to his wife, a short temper. He has found that he can avoid nocturnal hypoglycemia, that is night sweats, nightmares, and headaches, by eating a large bedtime snack. During the past three months, he has gained 15 pounds. The DGO's signs and symptoms consistent with mild, moderate, or severe hypoglycemia. What are the causes?
DGO's case illustrates one of the major hazards of aggressive blood glucose targets and intensive insulin therapy, hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is a fact of life for patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus, virtually all of whom experience a hypoglycemic episode at one time or another. Nocturnal hypoglycemia is of particular concern. A syndrome called dead in bed has been described for patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus, who experience repeated hypoglycemia and have an underlying cardiovascular pathology, and die in their sleep. Hypoglycemia is a blood glucose concentration less than 70 mg per deciliter, and its occurrence is potentially fatal if not promptly recognized and treated. However, the exact level at which a patient experiences symptoms is difficult to define. Clinical hypoglycemia is associated with typical autonomic, that is neurogenic, and neuroglycopenic symptoms relieved by the administration of a quickly absorbed carbohydrate. We will briefly look at its pathophysiology. Normal brain function depends on glucose, the exclusive fuel for cerebral metabolism. Because the brain is unable to synthesize or store glucose, it must be provided with a constant exogenous quantity via the brain's blood supply. As blood glucose concentrations fall, a series of physiologic responses occur to restore glucose levels. These responses create symptoms warning a patient to take corrective action by consuming carbohydrates. If these counter-regulatory responses fail to alert the patient and blood glucose concentrations fall below a critical level, cognitive function becomes impaired, and confusion and coma may ensue. In people without diabetes, the peripheral responses to hypoglycemia are so efficient that clinically important hypoglycemia probably never occurs. As glucose levels fall between 50 and 60 mg per deciliter, a series of neuroendocrine events occur, raising the plasma glucose concentration back toward normal by increasing hepatic glucose output. The major hormone responsible for producing acute recovery from insulin-induced hypoglycemia is glucagon, however, epinephrine alone also can produce near-normal recovery. Rising levels of adrenergic and cholinergic hormones generate warning symptoms of hypoglycemia. When hypoglycemia is prolonged, growth hormone and cortisone play a greater role in producing recovery. Patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus who maintain insulin depots throughout the day are predisposed to severe hypoglycemic reactions because deficiencies in the normal feedback system occur with time. Glucagon secretion becomes deficient within the first two to five years after diagnosis, and by ten years or longer, epinephrine secretion may become impaired. The latter defect leads to asymptomatic hypoglycemia or hypoglycemic unawareness. Certain circumstances predispose patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus to severe hypoglycemia. These include a. A defective counter-regulatory hormonal response to hypoglycemia which may be further diminished with frequent hypoglycemia. b. Medications such as beta blockers that diminish early warning signs of impending hypoglycemia. c. Intensive insulin therapy that can alter secretion of counter-regulatory hormones d. Skipped meals or inadequate carbohydrate intake relative to the insulin dose. e. Physical activity, and f. Excessive alcohol intake. We will now discuss the symptoms. The signs and symptoms associated with hypoglycemia vary in intensity according to the presence of cognitive deficits and the patient's ability to self-treat the reaction. They vary substantially from one patient to another. Symptoms are conventionally divided into two categories, neurogenic, or autonomic, and neuroglycopenic. Autonomic symptoms include sweating, intense hunger, palpitations, tremor, tingling, and anxiety. Epinephrine is thought to mediate many of the neurogenic responses to hypoglycemia. 
Neuroglycopenic symptoms resulting from neuronal fuel deprivation glucose include difficulty concentrating, lethargy, confusion, agitation, weakness, and possibly, slurred speech, dizziness, and fainting. Profound behavioral changes, seizures, and coma are more severe manifestations of neuroglycopenia. Prolonged, severe neuroglycopenia ultimately results in death. Symptoms of mild, moderate, severe, and nocturnal hypoglycemia are as follows. 1. In mild hypoglycemia, symptoms include tremor, palpitations, sweating, and intense hunger. Diminished cerebral function is not present, and patients are capable of self-treating. 2. Moderate hypoglycemia. Moderate hypoglycemic reactions include neuroglycopenic as well as autonomic symptoms such as headache, mood changes, irritability, decreased attention, and drowsiness. Patients may require assistance in treating themselves because of the presence of impaired judgment or weakness. Symptoms are more severe, usually last longer, and often require a second dose of a simple carbohydrate. 3. In severe hypoglycemia, symptoms of severe hypoglycemia include unresponsiveness, unconsciousness, or convulsions. These reactions require assistance from another individual for appropriate treatment. Approximately 10% of patients treated with insulin experience at least one severe, disabling episode of hypoglycemia per year that requires emergency treatment with parenteral glucagon or IV glucose. 4. Nocturnal hypoglycemia. Tingling of the lips and tongue is a common complaint of patients who experience nocturnal hypoglycemia. These patients also may complain of headache and difficulty arising in the morning, nightmares, or nocturnal diaphoresis. Family members should be conscious of any unusual sounds or activity while the patient is sleeping. EGO has mild to moderate hypoglycemic reactions, which he is able to self-treat. These are likely caused by over-insulinization and insulin stacking, giving rapid or short-acting insulin injections too close together, so that the doses stack on top of the other with his rapid-acting insulin. The next question reads, evaluate DGO's overall control. What signs and symptoms in DGO are consistent with over-insulinization and insulin stacking? How should he be managed? The following is a list of signs and symptoms of over-insulinization in DGO. 1. A total daily insulin dose of more than 1 unit per kilogram. This dose is unusually high for a patient with type 1 diabetes mellitus, who should not be resistant to the action of insulin. 2. Weight gain in the past several months. This is secondary to the anabolic effects of insulin as well as DGO's increased carbohydrate intake to match his high insulin doses for treatment of hypoglycemia. 3. Frequent hypoglycemic reactions. 4. High glycemic variability, i.e., blood glucose concentrations that fluctuate wildly between hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia. In DGO's case, high blood glucose concentrations may represent reactive hypoglycemia or overtreatment of hypoglycemic episodes. His low blood glucose level may represent excessive rapid-acting insulin at bedtime and insulin stacking of his rapid-acting insulin after lunch. At lunchtime, he is administering a high sugar correction dose of insulin glulazine too soon, his mealtime glulazine is still likely at a peak action and working to lower his prandial blood glucose. By administering additional glulazine soon after the meal, the two insulin doses are adding up, or stacking, causing hypoglycemia. 5. Near-normal A1C levels indicate mean blood glucose concentrations that must be within the normal range even though the patient has recorded numerous high blood glucose concentrations. Patients treated with intensive insulin therapy in the Diabetes Control and Complications trial experienced hypoglycemic episodes three times more often than patients treated with standard insulin therapy. 
AA1C levels were approximately 7.2%. EGO should be managed by discontinuing his high sugar corrections at bedtime and after lunch. He should check his blood glucose pre-meal, one to two hours after meals, and at bedtime to obtain a better picture of his glucose patterns and insulin requirements. He should avoid the large bedtime snack because one should not have to add food just to avoid hypoglycemia, i.e., the insulin regimen should be adjusted. He should also begin testing his blood glucose at 2 or 3 a.m. to assess whether he is still experiencing nocturnal hypoglycemia after stopping the bedtime insulin glulazine. It will be important that he records the actual dose he administers before each meal and brings the record to clinic so that his insulin doses can be fine-tuned. Next, if he is capable, an algorithm for adjusting his preprandial insulin glulazine doses should be provided to minimize hypoglycemic and hyperglycemic reactions, eventually he can transition to counting carbohydrates. The next question reads, how should DGO's hypoglycemic episodes be managed? As DGO illustrates, many patients with diabetes mellitus are frightened of hypoglycemia and have a tendency to overtreat their reactions with, for example, large quantities of juice or regular soda. This should be discouraged because overcorrection together with glucose generated by counter-regulatory hormones ultimately results in hyperglycemia. The key to successful management of hypoglycemia is recognition and prevention. Because early warning symptoms of hypoglycemia vary from person to person, it is important that DGO learns to recognize and pay attention to his earliest warning symptoms and treat early. Patients generally can recall prodromal symptoms after recovery from a severe hypoglycemic reaction if they have not developed hypoglycemic unawareness. As a caveat, occasionally patients feel hypoglycemic after their blood glucose concentrations have been normalized from very high levels with intensive insulin therapy, owing to the amount of blood glucose change. Encourage patients to test their blood glucose level any time they feel unusual to verify a low blood glucose concentration before treatment. DGO should treat his symptoms only if he is truly hypoglycemic. A second component of prevention is determining its cause and taking preventive or corrective action. This entails assessment of his diet, did he skip or delay a meal or change its content, exercise pattern, time of insulin administration, insulin dose, and accuracy of carbohydrate counting and dose administered. If hypoglycemic reactions consistently occur at a certain time of day, he should determine whether this corresponds with a mealtime dose of his rapid-acting insulin and reduces that insulin dose by 1 to 2 units. If his fasting plasma glucose is running low, his insulin glargine dose can be reduced. If a reaction occurs, DGO should be instructed to treat it as follows. In the case of mild hypoglycemia most hypoglycemic reactions are managed readily with the equivalent of 10 to 20 grams of glucose for examples of carbohydrate sources containing 15 grams of glucose. If the blood concentration remains low after 15 minutes, the patient should ingest another 10 to 20 grams of carbohydrate. This quick-acting source of glucose should be followed by a small complex carbohydrate or protein snack, e.g., milk, or peanut butter sandwich to provide a continual source of glucose if a meal is not scheduled within the next one to two hours. An easy rule of thumb that can be used by patients is, 15-15-15. 15, 15, 15. 15 grams of glucose followed by a second 15 grams if the patient is still symptomatic after 15 minutes. Glucose tablets are available and have the added benefit of being pre-measured to prevent overtreatment of hypoglycemia. Glucose gels, liquid, or small tubes of cake frosting are useful for children or patients who become uncooperative and combative when hypoglycemic.
In the case of moderate to severe hypoglycemia glucagon can be injected by the subcutaneous route or IM which is preferred route into the deltoid or anterior thigh region. Glucagon is used when a patient is unable to self-treat their hypoglycemia caused by exogenous insulin. The dose of glucagon recommended to treat moderate or severe hypoglycemia for a child younger than 5 years of age is 0.25 to 0.5 mg, for children 5 to 10 years of age, 0.5 to 1 mg, and for patients older than 10 years, 1 mg. Parents, spouses, or other close contacts should be taught how to mix, draw up, and administer glucagon during emergency situations. Kits with pre-filled syringes containing 1 mg glucagon are available. Patients who are given glucagon should be positioned so that their face is turned toward the floor to prevent aspiration in the event of vomiting. As soon as the patient awakens, 10 to 25 minutes, he or she should be fed. Let's now discuss intravenous glucose. If glucagon is unavailable, the patient should be taken to the hospital's emergency department, where he or she can be treated with IV glucose, approximately 10 to 25 grams administered as 20 to 50 milliliters of 50% dextrose for 1 to 3 minutes, in preference to glucagon. After the bolus injection of glucose, IV glucose, that is 5 to 10 grams per hour, should be continued until the patient has gained consciousness and is able to eat. The next question reads, MTM, a 35-year-old, 75-kilogram, unemployed man, has had type 1 diabetes mellitus since the age of 3. As a consequence of the diabetes mellitus, he has developed proliferative retinopathy and progressive diabetic nephropathy. His current serum creatinine is 2.2 mg per deciliter. MTM has an erratic lifestyle. Because he does not work, he often stays out late at night and sleeps late into the morning. His insulin is injected whenever he awakens, and his meals are irregularly spaced. Each time he comes to the clinic, he brings with him a complete log of glucose concentrations that range from 80 to 140 mg per deciliter. He has two to three severe hypoglycemic reactions a month that require trips to the emergency department for treatment with IV glucose. On several occasions, his blood glucose concentration has been 30 mg per deciliter, and he states he may feel a little weak, but otherwise feels, not too bad. MTM's last A1C was 10%. He says that he adheres to the following insulin regimen. 18 units neutral protamine Hagedorn and 11 units regular insulin before breakfast. 10 units regular insulin before lunch and dinner, and 14 units neutral protamine Hagedorn at bedtime. At this visit, MTM comes with his girlfriend. He has a large gash on his nose that occurred three days ago when he lost consciousness at approximately 1.30 p.m. while pushing his stalled car. He was unable to eat lunch at the usual hour because he had problems with his car. Assess MTM's hypoglycemic reactions and blood glucose control. Should his current insulin regimen be continued? How should he be managed? MTM illustrates a patient with type 1 diabetes mellitus who has defective glucose counterregulation and, as a result, is unable to counteract a hypoglycemic reaction effectively. He also is an example of a patient who should not have aggressive blood glucose targets because he does not feel the symptoms of a low blood sugar and has already developed end-stage organ damage that is proliferative retinopathy and nephropathy. Neither is likely to be reversed with improved glycemic control. In fact, proliferative retinopathy may actually worsen with intensive insulin therapy initially. 
In the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial Study, severe hypoglycemic reactions were three times more common among patients treated with intensive insulin therapy, and nocturnal hypoglycemia accounted for 41% of the total hypoglycemic episodes. In patients with defective counterregulation the risk of severe hypoglycemia may be 25 times higher than in patients with adequate counterregulatory mechanisms treated with intensive insulin therapy. MTM is at great risk for death secondary to hypoglycemia. MTM's lifestyle is erratic, he eats irregularly, and his reported blood glucose concentrations that is 80 to 140 mg per deciliter do not correspond to his elevated A1C value. This may indicate that MTM's technique is incorrect or that he simply fills in the log with fictitious numbers before he comes to the clinic. Irregular entries in different colored inks and bloodstains usually indicate authentic records. As noted, the primary hormones that are secreted in response to a low blood glucose concentration are glucagon and epinephrine. In patients who have had type 1 diabetes mellitus for longer than 2 to 5 years, a deficiency in glucagon secretion is a relatively consistent finding, and these patients must rely on epinephrine to reverse low blood glucose concentrations. Unfortunately, approximately 40% of patients with long-standing type 1 diabetes mellitus that is, for 8 to 15 years, have defective epinephrine secretion as well, and this may be related to the development of autonomic neuropathy. Patients whose diabetes mellitus is tightly controlled also have reduced counter-regulatory hormone responses to hypoglycemia. As illustrated by MTM, patients with defective epinephrine secretory responses also lose the warning signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. These patients are said to have hypoglycemia unawareness because they have no awareness of blood glucose concentrations less than 50 mg per deciliter. In these individuals, loss of consciousness, seizures, or irrational behavior may be the first objective sign of exceedingly low blood glucose concentrations. The glycemic threshold for symptoms also is lowered in patients on intensive insulin therapy whose glucose concentrations have been lowered to normal or near normal levels. Consequently, their hypoglycemic reactions may go unnoticed and untreated until they lose consciousness. MTM should be managed as follows. Because his waking, sleeping, and eating patterns are highly irregular, MTM should be treated with an insulin regimen that addresses his lifestyle. For example, he could be switched to a basal bolus insulin regimen, in which he can give himself a rapid-acting insulin just before he actually intends to eat. A dose of insulin glargine or detamere could be given before his first meal to supply a basal level of insulin between meals. Additionally, when switching to insulin glargine or detamere MTM should be provided this insulin in a pen formulation as to avoid any dosing errors from drawing insulin into a syringe based on MTM's current symptoms of visual impairment. Because MTM has no warning symptoms for hypoglycemia, the importance of regular self-monitoring of blood glucose should be emphasized. When blood glucose testing was reviewed with MTM, it was discovered that his eyesight was so poor that he was unable to distinguish between the right and wrong side of the glucose test strip. Furthermore, because he had lost his depth of field, he was unable to apply the drop of blood into the test strip. To address this situation, MTM's girlfriend was taught how to perform blood glucose testing. Also, a glucose monitor that requires a very small blood sample and beeps with an adequate blood sample would be beneficial for him. MTM's girlfriend also was taught how to recognize and treat symptoms of hypoglycemia and how to administer glucagon. Often, patients ignore early warning symptoms and progress to a point that they lose the judgment needed to treat the condition. If MTM has not yet become combative, a quick-acting carbohydrate source should be offered. 
if he has lost consciousness, glucagon should be injected. All of these maneuvers diminished the frequency of MTM's severe hypoglycemic reactions. On the whole, his blood glucose concentrations were maintained below 180 mg per deciliter, and he remained relatively free of hypoglycemic symptoms. MTM's A1C using a basal bolus insulin regimen was 8.0%. So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arawa, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 329.